Hey everyone, it's Friday night. Friday night, first Friday of the month. That means it's first stone. I am back. Thanks for uh, coming and watching here. Uh, I, I know there's better things to do on Friday, especially as I'm looking at my window. It's beautiful out. The sun's out. A uh, little light breeze. All the blooms are going on. My allergies are going crazy. Uh, yeah, spring is here. So that's that's an awesome thing. I, I understand here in Oregon, uh, we're gonna have sun. We're gonna have sun for the next like four or five days. I mean. That's unbelievable for Oregon, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so I'm hoping you're either uh, um, enjoying this later, like some people watch this later, or if you're with me live, hey, fantastic. Hey, happy Friday night to you. Uh, I'm going to talk tonight about something I, I put on Facebook, and I, and I read it a few days ago. Tim Keller, he is a, a pastor in uh, New York, and uh, a famous guy. He's, he's written lots of books. He wrote one uh, called, um, I think, The Meaning of Marriage is one, and... Uh, uh, he went on God. That's probably the the best book I've I've seen on that. And just just a great writer. Honestly, I think he's a better writer than preacher. Uh, but he said this, and he said this on his Twitter account. He said, "If you say, I believe in God, I trusted God, and He didn't come through. You only trusted God to meet your agenda, not a God who could set your agenda." Well. I read that and I went, yeah, that's 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 true. Uh, and then I was reading the comments and somebody just ripped them. Uh, somebody was not happy with that comment. And they were talking about how they were abused. Uh, I, it sounded as if it was in the church and that, you know, their agenda was not to get abused. And apparently, the, the, you know, God's agenda was different. So God must hate him. And, you, you know, you know how that logic rolls out. And you could see that from Tim's perspective, you know, as a pastor, you write something like that. You gotta be really careful with your words because you gotta you kind of gotta extrapolate how people are going to perceive what you say. Now, honestly, you you can't take every angle that someone's gonna gonna perceive it because we all perceive through our own our own prisms, right? And those prisms are based upon our own experiences and and behavioral learning and all the different things we've talked about. Uh, but this one, you can tell that when I reread it after reading that guy's comments, I went, oh yeah, this. This one's a lot deeper than I think Tim meant it to be. And uh, I, I want to go through it because there's a lot of truth to this idea of conflicting agendas, uh, God's agenda versus ours, that play out. But what do you do uh, with that other piece? I mean, because the guy was right. He's like, well, are you saying that it was God's agenda to have me go through what I went through with this abuse and all this kind of stuff and that, um, you know, I was out of a line with God's will and that's why it happened? That was a really bad misunderstanding on that person's part. He, he was speaking out of his pain and, and not out of anything theological. And so I kind of want to uh, deal tonight with, you know, the heavy, deep and real topic of um, what do you do when, when what God's doing doesn't make any sense to you? When you believed in God and you trusted God and it just seemed like God didn't come through or wasn't there or didn't care or whatever it might be. Uh, I think that's a reality for a lot of people, and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think I don't think you can just throw that out. I don't think you can just say, "Well, you know, you're not mature enough in the faith, or you, you know, God's ways are mysterious." Uh, blah blah blah. I, I think you have to deal with it. And so uh, let's take a little time tonight and, and talk about what happens in your life when you know God God doesn't do what you think should be done. Uh, so for, first question: Raise your hands. How many of you have had a situation where? Uh, something's happened and you're like, that's, God should have come through. God should have intervened. Why didn't that happen? And so I want to take on, I want to take on the, the, the 50,000 foot view of this first. And then I want to drill down. I want to, I want to, what I call it peeling the onion, right? You ever seen an onion that peels till you get to the center? Um, I want to peel the onion on this a little bit. So you gotta, you gotta start with this concept of free will. Okay. And one of the things that, that, that if you think about it, Everything that's happened to you uh, in life is is either because you made a free will decision and there were consequences, or somebody else made a free will decision and there were consequences. Um, that's accepting natural disaster kind of stuff, and there are natural disaster kind of things that happen, and that's because the earth is fallen, and we can get into that. But I want I want to talk about this lane of of free will first. So think about think about the life that you've lived. Um, have you had bad experiences? I mean, yeah, of course, Jesus said you'd have trouble in this world. So think about your bad experiences. What what was the causation of them? I know for me, uh, a lot of my bad experiences, my traumatic, abusive experiences were because people were idiots and they used their free will to uh, go against what God would have them do. 
and I suffered the consequences of it. And so you're thinking, where was God intervening on this? Um, he wasn't, yeah, he didn't intervene really, but did he? <laughs> That's the question. Didn't seem like it at the time, right? If you're being abused, you're, you're like, well, God should be, probably be intervening. Uh, and we'll get to where God was in all this here as we talk tonight. Uh, so, so we have this free will problem. We have our free will, we have other people's free will. Now, let me ask you this question. Have you ever done something with your free will that hurt somebody else? If you're saying no, you got to think a little harder. Uh, we all do dumb stuff. We say hurtful things. We do hurtful things. Uh, some of us have done uh, ugh, things that are much more hurtful than the usual. And you got to own that, right? But uh, all of our free will is a mess. And it's because of the fall. So in our in our theology, in our faith as Christians, we know the, that there was a fall, and and the God's God's thing, the God's entire creation was corrupted. The whole thing was corrupted, and that that our emotions are perverted. They they don't work right, and that how we treat each other isn't the way we're meant to treat each other, and that how we how we speak, think, and and act is not in line with God. God would have us then feel and act now. Most of us would say, and I, and I hear this a lot, well, you know, I'm not that bad. What about the murderers and the rapists and the abusers and all blah, blah, blah? You know, the pedophiles, all these guys, right? Yeah, I mean, in a secular perspective, that's all much worse than lying or cheating on your taxes or all that. But from God's perspective, sin is sin. And, and so we all fall short of the glory of God. Not one of us is right, just not one, Scripture says. And, and this is where we get this is where we get a little off because what we'll say is somebody who's bad, you know, in our in our in our um, way of comparing things, they should have their free will taken. God should intervene and not allow them to do that. Well, okay. But why shouldn't God intervene on your free will? Because you're so good. I know for me, I'm not good. I, there's nothing good about me. The only, the only righteousness I have is Jesus. I, I have none of my own. <laughs> if it weren't for God and the Holy Spirit in my life, I'd be just as big of a schmuck as everyone else. It's only the Holy Spirit that holds me back and convicts me of sin and, and changes me and transforms me and all that. It's not, nothing to do with me. Trust me. And, and this is the rub. So from the 50,000 foot view, you, you, you see what Tim is saying here. That, that, you know, if, if you believe in God and all this stuff and he didn't come through and you're like, oh, God didn't come through for me. God, Jesus, Tim's saying, Tim saying, well, you're just trying to get your own agenda done and you're not understanding God's agenda. Well, okay. But if you're trying to understand how bad things happen to you, you have to look at the free will question. You know, why didn't God take away that person's free will? Well, the reality is he had to take everyone's free will away because you're, we're all bad. We all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has rebelled against him. Every one of us is a sinner. So if you take one, you got to take them all, or you got to take none. And God has chosen not to take our free will, and that has resulted in horrible, horrible things. <laughs> people are people are crazy, people are nuts, people are brutal, uh, people are, are are you know when they when they get uh, when they get in their flesh when they get in, in let's say they're not even believers if they get just whispers of, of demonic kind of stuff, they do terrible, horrible things. And we look at that and go, oh, yeah, yeah. How, how can God just watch and allow that? Well, this is the second part. And we've talked about God's justice before. No one's getting away with anything. And there's going to be justice. And so from God's perspective, he looks at it and says, um, he's, he, he looks at things differently. See, we look at things in terms of linear. He doesn't see things linear. It's all laid out in front of him. And so he says, hey, uh, you know, you did X, Y, Z. That was a really horrible thing you're going to get yours for that. You're going to, you're going to have to pay for it. And let's say I'm a Christian and let's say I, let's say I murder somebody and I come to the faith in jail, woo -hoo, jail conversion, uh, conversion. And uh, I truly believe in Jesus and, I, and I've, I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior and I've asked to forgive him my sins. Sure, my sins are forgiven, but I still pay the penalty. I, I, I still, wanna, even if I didn't go to jail, I got away with it, right? I still got to end up in front of Jesus, and He's going to say, "You've lost rewards. You've lost, you've lost all sorts of stuff because you know you're going to get into heaven." But like Scripture says, is one, you know, escaping the flames, because that you, you're gonna you're gonna suffer. You're gonna lose because of that. And so from God's perspective, 
when he allows people to have their free will, even though it's horrible for us, uh, he looks at it and goes, it's going to work out because there is justice. Now, you got to add a third leg to this stool. So first leg was, was this idea of the 50,000 foot view of free will. Everyone's got free will. You, you have to have free will. Either everyone gets it or no one gets it. Okay. The second part of this, there's justice. No matter what, everyone's going to, everyone, every knee's going to bow. Everyone's works are going to be put to the test. Everybody is going to be held accountable to the Lord, right? Christians, we go before the Bema seat. We're going to get judged based upon what we've done. Those who are not believers, you get judged on your own righteousness. And there's not one righteous, and it's going to go badly for you. It's going to go badly for Christians because we're going to lose out on all sorts of blessings and rewards and all sorts of stuff for the dumb stuff we've done. And that's right. It should. Everybody should be held to account because it's the only way that makes the system work. It's the only thing in my brain that makes it logical. Because if, if people could just run amok and kill and, and, and rape and, and abuse and, and do all the things that they do, and there was no accountability for it, how could you believe in a God like that? I mean, if Hitler could get away with killing six million Jews, and he just dies and, and it's nothingness, and, and he doesn't have to be held account, that, that would be a problem. Uh, we would we would just go. I, I can't I can't get there with that. There has to be accountability. Okay, so we got two legs as well. Now now, um, I, w I was going to talk about a third leg, which I have to remember real quick because I was talking about the first two. Third leg of this stool is that as as we're dealing with this stuff, we have to remember that the 85 years, 90 years, let's say you're, you're, you're really good, get, uh, get 100 years, 120, some, I think someone lived 120 years, who'd want to do that? But someone lived 120 years, let's say you get that. It is a dust mite compared to eternity. And we live for eternity, you know, it's, it's those of us that are believers, we live in eternity with Jesus, and those who are not believers live in eternity in hell we're eternal and and you know that because you feel your you feel your soul you feel there's something more everyone kind of feels there's something more even the, it, excuse me, the spiritual people right the spiritual people out there they're like well, i'm not i don't believe in god but i'm spiritual whatever the heck that means everybody knows there's something else in them this is why all these religions exist it, it, islam and hindu and buddha and all this crap uh, everyone has something in them that says there's more We just know that that more is Jesus, and here's the reason why, just in case you're wondering what's the difference. Well, God, through Jesus Christ, is the only one who died for you. In all the other religions, you got to come to some kind of special knowledge, or you got to work hard enough, or you got to prove yourself to God, and all this other stuff, which you can never do. In our faith, God came to us, and that's the difference. It's a huge difference, and it's the only religion where God came to us. So that, but let's say you're going to live a hundred and let's say you live a hundred years. That's a good round number, but eternity is eternity, right? Are you really going to be that concerned when you get to eternity about what happened to you in the speck of time that is now? And that's a hard, that's a harder leg. I mean, the first two are legs that you can get, get your head wrapped around. The third one's a little harder because you have to have the long game in your head and not give as much value to things in this life as you give to the next life. And that's why scripture says, keep your eyes on heavenly things, you know, keep your rewards in heaven, not on earth. Over and over and over again, we, we're told we're citizens of heaven. We're just passing through here, right? You're not, you're in the world, not of the world is one of the phrases Christians use, right? And so you got to keep the long game in, in mind. And if you keep the long game in mind, then you can say, I don't have to be so worried about this X thing happening. I don't have to give so much value to it. Now that's really hard when when it's you've been abused, especially when you're like like me. I, I went through a lot of abuse. Um, yeah, I suffer for it. I, I have PTSD, and you know, and I, some days I do well, some days I don't do well at all. And uh, uh, there are days where I have hard days, man. Uh, and I can get wrapped around the axle thinking that that matters. And it's only my faith that gets me out of that thinking, nah, I, I got to realize that there, there's more, there's more. And there's going to come a time when I have a perfected body and all the stuff, right? And that's what I live for. 
And so I try not to give much value to what happened and the consequences of what happened. So for this first part I wanted to get to with, with Keller, if you say I believe in God, I trusted God and he didn't come through, you only trusted God to meet your agenda, not a God who could set your agenda. Um, the first thing we have to understand about that is really this free will thing. Now let, let's deal with, with like natural disasters or illness or whatever. So my mom had multiple sclerosis. She was bedridden pretty much the time, wasn't bedridden, but she was she was like in a, in a walker in a wheelchair by the time I was born, right after I was born, she was really sick. And then she was bedridden. And uh, um, I never, I, I mean, I think she was in a nursing home by the time I was six, seven years old, whatever it was, and I didn't see her very much, whatever it might be. And I remember praying to God, you know, why would you do this to her? Why, why, what did she do? <laughs> She, she, she was Catholic, and then she was Lutheran. It's like, it's not like she's not a believer. You know, are you punishing her? What, what, are you punishing me? What, what's the deal? And as a child, you think like a child. As an adult, you think like an adult. And if you get into your faith, you recognize that, that um, outside of the free will things that happen in life, where, where you act and have a consequence, or someone acts and you, you're the consequence of their action, uh, people are fallen. We have fallen bodies. We're, we're never meant to die. And that's why we fight so hard to live when we're dying. Well, we're not meant to get sick like this either. And so um, it's kind of tragic when, when people do because we have these fallen bodies. And it can be MS. It could be cancer. It could be Parkinson's. It could be COVID. It could be, you know, you name it. I've got, I've got all sorts of medical issues with me um, that, that, you know, cause me all sorts of grief. Uh, they're not supposed to be like that. And as Christians, we know that we're going to get renewed bodies and it all works out because, you know, we're just in a fallen place. So sometimes the, the traumas we, ex we experience um, are because we're fallen. And that, that's the case. Now, the earth is fallen too. So there are tsunamis and that sucks. And there are earthquakes and there are fires and there are all sorts of stuff. Um, what the insurance companies call acts of God. I thought this was a great line, by the way. I saw this great meme that said, never buy insurance from a Christian insurance company because everything to them is an act of God. Do you get it? They never pay for acts of God. Okay, so we know that if in, the, in, this, in this why does stuff happen question, I mean, just generally, why does stuff happen? It's a three-legged stool too. It's all from this one place. We're all fallen. And then it goes, either it's actions of yourself or somebody else that are sinful, and the consequences and collateral damage. It's your fallen body and you get sick and you know you have all these different things happen to you. Or the earth is fallen. The whole creation is fallen. And so there are these natural disaster things. And so I get what the guy was saying when he was saying, you know, I, I, I pray that God would intervene. I, 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 I believed, I, I trusted that God would, would come down and save me and, and do all these things. Um, and, and he didn't. And that's the next part I want to get to. Is, didn't he? One of the things I like to tell people when I preach is, uh, especially people who have gone through traumas and things, is thus far, you've survived 100% of whatever you've been through. Thus far, you've survived 100% of whatever you've been through. Now, I'm not saying it was hard. I'm not saying it wasn't um, appropriate or inappropriate or whatever it might be. I'm not saying that you weren't scarred by it and, and damaged by it. I'm saying you survived it. So when you say that God didn't come through, what do you mean God didn't come through? So when I looked back at my past, one of the realizations I had as I was kind of going through a uh, kind of a healing process and an awakening process and kind of get close to God again was where were you during this episode or that episode? And I was very specific about you know, these things happened, and where were you? Because the expectation I had was you would not allow it to happen because I'm kind of your guy, right? And God's like, no, um, and this is what he taught me. He says, that person had free will. They used it wrongly. They abused you, and I intervened with the Holy Spirit to make sure it wasn't any worse. When I thought about that, I thought, is that a cop-out statement, or is, is, that, is that a good statement? I thought, that's a pretty good statement, actually. Because in my case, yeah, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been, it could have been a lot worse. Let me just put it that way. And, uh, and it wasn't. 
and the Holy Spirit agree. Now, I'm not saying that it, it lessens what happened to me. It, does, it doesn't. It doesn't change the, the the you know consequences of what happened to me. But if you look back and say, was God's hand there? And, and you're just you're just kind of like I tell people to look at this way. Stop looking at things first person. Start looking at things in third person. If you're if you're examining especially yourself and your past, look at it as if you're looking at the situation, not as if you're in the situation. And sometimes then you can see God's hand a little bit differently. And you can say, you know, that should have gone a lot worse. Or this should have gone this way when it went that way. Or, um, man, I was just lucky to get out of that. Well, no, no, you weren't. That was God, you know, doing his thing. And so uh, when I think about, you know, the free will piece and God's agenda piece and my agenda piece, I have an expectation of God that really is based upon the things I want. And I think we all do. I mean, part part of our sinful nature is selfishness. And so when we think about what we want from God, we say, okay, I want security, I want protection, I want financial stability, I, you know, we come up with all these things. And we, and we put churchy terms on them, I want provision, <laughs> I, I, want, I, I want to make sure that, that uh, um, yeah, salvation, all these different pieces that you always, you're always talking about, but we want the easy life. We just want it. We want, we want to be able to get along. And if you look at scripture, it doesn't say that Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. Jesus said that people are going to hate you. Now it doesn't say that they're going to hate you and just kind of leave you alone. It says they are going to act on that hate. It, it says, and, and Peter says, why are you why are you surprised you're suffering? That's the that's what we do. We're Christians. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, be careful what you sign up for. And so, we have an expectation of God sometimes that I think is unrealistic. And I think this is what Tim was driving at: was when we when we go to God, we're supposed to go with Him all our prayers, all our petitions, everything we want. But understand that everything we ask for is selfish. So even when you're saying, I want Aunt May to, to make it through her cancer, why do you want Aunt May to make it through her cancer? Because that's your will. I mean, you want Aunt May to live because you don't want Aunt May to die because you want Aunt May around. That's your that's your will. That's your selfish desire. Is that what's best for Aunt May? I don't know. And, that, and that's the key. I don't know. Only God knows what's best for Aunt May. So sometimes, like, I'm struggling with something, and, and it's like, God, would you just come relieve this dumb thing? And <laughs> it's funny, <laughs> thinking about a situation this morning, and uh, uh, God's like, well, that's your will. Is that what's best for you? Here's the situation this morning. So I'm walking around Walmart, and I got to pick up, I don't know, I'm picking up, picking up something. And uh, always dog stuff. It's always dog stuff. And I, I don't know why, but my I have this heel thing where it just starts itching out of nowhere. And you ever get your, your bottom of your foot kind of itches, and you got a shoe on, you can't do anything about it, and it just drives you batty. And so I'm in Walmart, and I'm like, okay, I'll pick up some of that uh, um, cream stuff that's the anti-itch stuff, whatever it is. <laughs> but i got I got to get all this stuff and still walk around. And this thing is dry. I, got, I can't itch it. It's driving me crazy. So I'm praying, Lord, will you intervene here? Will you give me a break? I mean, I'm just walking around Walmart. Can you just fix this, right? I ask God for everything. I, you know, it says by prayer and petition, so I ask God for everything. And he's like, you'll make it to the car. <laughs> like, that's not the answer I want. I'm in Walmart right now. I want you to fix this dumb, itching thing that's driving me nuts. <laughs> and God's like, uh, suck it up, cupcake. Uh, be patient. <laughs> and I'm not a patient person. And so I'm like, okay, you got to get me to the car again. So, so I'm not rushing because that God didn't say, well, just run through the store and do it. I, I took my time and I did my thing and oh, it was just crazy. It was horrible. But as soon as I put this medicated crap on my foot, it worked. It was fine. It was done. And I actually had to go to two other stores and I never felt it again. And I kind of chuckled. I was like, what was God doing there? Right? Well, he was just trying to get me to be more, more, uh, long suffering and patient and you know just just trust him that I'm not dying and that I don't need to do something right away and I don't have to act on all my impulses and you know that it's like be still and know I am God and you know, if I wanted to use the Tom's message version of that be shut up and do what I say uh, 
so that was kind of why I was chuckling about this morning because I was just thinking about that that just this 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 morning that sometimes when we pray we're just praying you know our will be done we're not praying his will be done and this is the hardest thing for a pastor I gotta be I'll be honest with you people ask me to pray for him or they ask me to pray for whatever is going on in their life or pray for this and that and the other and I'm conflicted because what I want is God's will to be done I want it to be done in my life, even though I whine and piss and moan about it. I want it to be done in other people's lives, even though they're asking for miracles. Okay. Now, I know Scripture says ask for everything. So we do, but I always, I always temper my prayers by saying, your will be done. The same way Jesus did. Jesus says, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine. It's not like he didn't ask that the cup, if the cup could be taken. He didn't, he didn't like not verbalize that. He did. He, he asked. But then he submitted himself. And I think that, that we have to remember our prayers that way. And this is what Tim's talking about in this, is we pray that God will do what we want. And then we, we do some biblical gymnastics sometimes to say, well, it lines up with God's will. And I've got to be honest with you. Some, no, sometimes it doesn't, doesn't line up with God's will and God's agenda. And so I want to talk about that I, I had a woman i'm just thinking about a story a, a woman in church it was kind of tragic kind of kind of hurtful uh somebody passed and this woman in in the most childlike way she's older woman said i can't believe she's gone i prayed that she'd live and she was like really struggling personally that this person had passed after she had prayed because she fully expected god to hear her prayer and do what she wanted because the person was a good person, a good churchgoer, a good you know Christian, and she didn't. I mean, honestly, she did not understand why the prayer didn't result in healing. And so, um, those are those moments that are that it just kind of it just it hurts because you hurt for the person and it's kind of cringeworthy that you don't you just don't really understand. You know, God, God's not like us. He's not just different than us. He's other than us. And that it's not our will be done, it's his will be done. And we don't have to understand everything he does. There, there's this great scene at the end of the book of Job. It starts like in chapter 38. <laughs> so Job has gone through his trial. And uh, you remember, if you remember the story, he's lost his kids, he's lost his wealth, he's lost his friends. They're all beating up on him and being jerks. His wife has told him to curse God and die. So, you know, every relationship's broken. He's questioning God. I'm a righteous man. Why are you doing this, man? This ain't fair. Blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the book, in chapter 38, and it goes through 42, um, God says, okay, you want to you want to have a tete-a-tete -tete with me? Gird yourself. Were you there when I made the oceans? Were you there when I made the mountains? And he just starts hammering Job. And Job realizes quickly that he's not God and that God is God. And, of course, he submits himself and apologizes and, and, and recognizes his place. And then God, of course, restores him um, multifold for what he went through. I don't know if he got a new wife or not. That doesn't, he didn't say that. I don't know. That wife was horrible. Um, sometimes God does things and he doesn't have to explain himself to us. <laughs> that is the hardest part for us because it doesn't make any sense. And we're like, we need to know, God, you need to tell us and explain this stuff to us. And he's like, I don't have to explain anything to you. And that was his answer to Job. You know, you read the book of Job and you get to the end of it and you're like, there's no explanation. Why do you do that? And God's like, I don't need to give you an explanation. I'm God. And I think that really bothers people. I know that sometimes uh, it bothers me. And then you have to rely on this idea that God does have your best interest at heart. And you got to trust that. It's all about faith. And, ooh, you know, we are a people of little faith. Just is. Excuse me, Jesus said, you know, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, he wasn't, he wasn't telling them, oh, if you had just a little bit of faith, you could do great things. He, he was chastising them because the scene is he wasn't able to drive out a demon. The, the, the disciples weren't. And they're like, why couldn't we do this? And he's like, well, this one goes away by prayer. But if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could move mountains. But apparently you don't. So you suck. Um, Jesus, Jesus was not commending them to have the faith of a mustard seed. He was beating them up because they had so little faith. And he, you know, how often do you say, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, ye of little faith? Well, we're, we're those people. We don't have much faith. 
And sometimes God requires of us to have faith that what he's deciding is good, even though we don't see it that way. And but we got to remember, that, and this goes back to what we're talking about. If we're fallen and all our emotions are fallen and our brains, our bodies, everything's fallen, how in the world can we understand God's ways? His ways are higher than ours. You know, he says that. And, and the prism through which we look at is so biased and it's so selfish that when God does something, we question him because we're just not going to believe it. I mean, this is, where, this is where atheists get their problem is their, their prism is so dense that they can't get themselves to see God because it's their will completely. They're not willing to submit into this idea of having faith and trusting God for whatever the reasons might be. And so for for this for this guy that was hammering Tim Keller, uh, yeah, I, I get it completely because I've I've been I've been there. I've been there when bad things have happened and you didn't cause any of it. It wasn't your fault and you're just victimized. And you think, why was I just victimized by this thing? Uh, but I think back to the disciples, they were victimized. I think back to um, you know, all sorts of people groups in, in history, they were victimized. Christians have been persecuted forever. They didn't do anything. They just believed something different than everyone else. It's not like they were going out and, and you know, raising villages in the name of Christianity. Uh, back when the, the, the Romans were, were torturing them and, and using them as, Nero was using them as lamp posts, and lighting them on fire to, to light the streets. I mean, horrible stuff. They didn't do anything. They just believed in the resurrected Christ. <laughs> and they were completely victims. And you have to hang on the promise of the Bible when it comes to this comment that he's making. That one, God has your best interests at heart. He's your biggest cheerleader. Two, um, he has plans to prosper you. Three, his ways are right and your ways are wrong. Um, four, you're not righteous. He is. Five, he doesn't have to explain anything to you. Six, you have to have faith and trust that even the stuff you disagree with or don't understand it is for our, our best interest. Seven, that this is this is an eternity we're talking about. We're not talking about a limited lifespan here. We're not talking about the value of this place and this time. We're talking about eternity so you can you know have some perspective about how much value you're going to give the things that happen to you here. Eight, you and your free will cause half of your problems. Nine, other people in their free will cause the other half, right? Ten, we're in a fallen place. It's not going to work. And here's something I didn't mention. I'll just throw this in as 11. Satan's the prince of this world. The times are evil, right? He's a defeated foe, but he is very powerful still. He, he, he runs the systems here. And he is in a time in America right now where he has everyone hating each other. Everybody's grouping up and they hate the other person. Everybody's judging. Everybody is in disunity. People are resorting to violence as a means to whatever end they think they're going to get. People don't respect each other. People can't even have difference of opinions and still be friends. Satan is doing incredible work right now, and he's having he's having a heyday here. Up is down, black is white, all this stuff. And if you dare open your mouth and say, eh, that ain't right, you know, you're canceled, whatever that means. You know, you can't cancel a Christian, for goodness sakes. But so many Christians are so scared of the current culture that they're afraid to say anything because they care more about what the world thinks of them than what Christ does. So, what does it mean when, you know, we set the groundwork here. What does it mean then when, when your agenda is different than God's agenda? Well, I want to I start with this verse. And, and it talks about how God uses all things for the good of those who love him. Okay. It doesn't say God uses all things and makes them good. It's not what it says. I mean, people can get that, that verse wrong. 
It says he uses all things, good, bad, ugly, mean, gross, disturbed, perverted, whatever, for the good of those who love him. So if you've had a, an abuse, if you've had a trauma, if you've had, um, let's say you're a combat vet and you've experienced some combat things, let's say you're a rape victim, let's say you've been traumatized by child abuse, uh, that was a loud bang in my in my house. So someone just fell down. Hope my wife's okay. Um, let's say any of these bad things have happened to you. Uh, God can use that for the good of those who love him. That's what scripture says. So you're thinking, what, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen to you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to experience things. It certainly says that all things are going to happen. And scripture is very clear that, that you're going to, you're going to suffer in this world. This world is a, is, is like I said, this is, the, this is Satan's world. People are, are, are horrible. Okay. We're fallen. If you don't have the Holy Spirit controlling you or holding you back or convicting you or anything, uh, transforming you, changing you, all the things, it's going to go badly. It just is. And I, I see friends on Facebook and, and I'm convinced, and they're not believers, that they're going to be miserable for the rest of their lives. I just watch what they say and do and go, they're just going to be miserable people for the rest of their lives just by their way they look. And, you know, it's life's tough. But as believers, we know that Christ will use all things for the good of those who love him. So, if you've been a victim of any sort, I don't care what it is. You know, I, I, I know somebody um, whose whose son was murdered, and she recently re recently reached out to me and said, "What do you think my my spiritual gift is?" I said, "You need to work with families. You have a passion for this." And the only reason she has a passion for it is because she's had this huge trauma. And, and this is what I mean. See, God will use your stuff to build the kingdom if you allow him to use your stuff to build the kingdom. And so for me, you know, here I am preaching about this stuff. It, it, the only reason I can preach about it is because I've lived it. I counsel folks, your pastoral counseling. The only reason I talk into their lives is because I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, right? I, I talk about healing because I've experienced it. I talk about the power of the Holy Spirit because I know it. I, I talk about Jesus and what he can do in terms of um, transforming your life because I experienced it right the only way I could experience that stuff though is being on the other side <laughs> you know I, I didn't grow up in this great Christian home and you know I went to Christian school or homeschooled and you know always was in the church and went to all the the Wednesday night little little things I, I gotta tell you a funny story when I was in high school someone invited me to one of those Wednesday night churchy things it was the worst experience it was like this is the silliest thing I've ever done in my life um, I remember too, I was, I was in high school and uh, I broke my thumb. I was playing on a church basketball team. Not that I was cared very much about church, uh, but they let me play basketball. And I broke my thumb and they brought me into the youth group and they all prayed over me thinking that my thumb would just remark remark remarkably get healed. And I'm sitting there going, you know, I didn't have any faith at the time. So I'm like, you know, what? Shall we do? What are you doing on my thumb? <laughs> You know, you, 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 you experience things in life. I was on the other side. But when you get onto this side, you can start to see how God's hand works. And so when I look at my agenda, let's take, take a look at this, this statement a little deeper. When I look at the things I want in life, there are definitely things I want in life that I think line up with Scripture just, just right down the middle. All right? And I don't get them. Just, just, I just point blank be honest with you. They're not happening. Even though it lines right up with Scripture. And I can I can tell you what Scripture says, and I can say this is the way it's supposed to be. And in this fallen world and the way this world works, you're not getting it. And you go, oh, well, that sucks. Right? There are other things I want that are not so much lining up with Scripture. And um I got to work on it. I, I wrestle with God over things all the time. I, I love the imagery of Jacob wrestling with God. Uh, it, you know, all night he wrestles with him and, and he says, I'm not, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. <laughs> That's one of those Jesus, 
uh, theophanies is what they call them. So I wrestle with God constantly over stuff. I am in constant conversation with him over things that my my selfishness wants versus what his will is. And it's not like I don't know what his will is. It's not like I don't know the difference between what I want and what he wants, because I, I can read. I know what the Bible says. But I have a hard time letting go of some stuff. And so you've got to progressively work through those things. And that's, and that's what Tim is saying here. God's agenda is what counts. And you've got to allow God to set your agenda instead of you saying, I'm going to set my agenda and God, I expect you to fulfill it. Because if that's the way you have a relationship, not with God, but with everybody, you're going to be sadly disappointed. People not going to do what you want them to do, right? You know, take any relations. Let's say you have a best friend or you have a boyfriend, girlfriend or whatever you have. And you say, here's what, here's the deal. This is my will. And this is what we're going to do. And uh, you're going to do exactly what I want you to do. They're going to laugh at you and say, good luck, so long. Hit the road, Jack, right? Well, same with God. He's like, who do you think you are? Who do you really think you are? The, the, and, this, and Scripture says, it says, it says that the clay doesn't tell the potter what to make here. And, and so this, this con concept that Keller was talking about, I, I agree with it 100%, is when you get to a place in your faith where you can let God set your agenda, it's like, what does that look like? Well, let me, let me kind of go through it because there are some, some specifics that are to you, but there are some general major points that I think you have to understand. When God sets your agenda, you have to understand that everything you think, say, or do is to glorify him. Everything. When you go to the store, how you carry yourself is to glorify God. Because people are watching. And I was wearing a shirt out today. I went to the post office. And it says, uh, I'm a pastor. Don't look so shocked. And the looks I get when I wear that shirt. It's hilarious. Uh, but I'm carrying myself. I'm, I'm, I'm representing Jesus. And whether I'm wearing that shirt or not, I'm representing Jesus everywhere I go. And so everything you think, say, or do has to, has to represent Jesus, has to glorify God. That's the first major piece of allowing God to set your agenda instead of you to set your agenda. Okay. Second, everything you think, say, or do has to be run through Scripture. Now, we fail. I'm not, I'm not going to say you do this well. I mean, none of us, none of us do this like perfectly. Every one of us fails at this every day, including me. But you got to know Scripture well enough to run it through it. <laughs> you know, if you're not reading your Bible and you don't know what Scripture says, you kind of generally have some idea or the pastor said something, um, you need to get in the Word. Because you can't run your ideas and your thoughts and your words and your actions through Scripture unless you know what Scripture says. Scripture says at one point it says, "Take every thought of, uh, to make every thought obedient to Christ." You know, take every thought captive to Christ. Actually, this verse says this: "Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ." Let's get the whole thing right for once. The idea is, I got to know Scripture well enough that as I'm about to say something. Am I doing it in a way that's honoring Jesus? Is it true? Is it, is it have salt? Is it loving and gentle? Right? Is, is it necessary? You know, am I just, am it, is it prideful? Is it judgmental? You know, I got to run through all these things. And that's why it says be slow to speak and quick to listen. <laughs> because you shouldn't just be spurting out stuff because you've got to run this through the whole gambit of scripture. Make sure that what you're saying is right. And again, we all fail at this. But you should be trying, right? You should be trying. That's part of, of letting God set your agenda. That's part of letting God set your agenda. Another thing about God, God setting your agenda is you got to think of the long game. So I did this sermon once. I called it uh, The Meeting. And it was really pretty funny. I, I put a, a Jesus cardboard cutout next to me. <laughs> I'm laughing because someone actually was upset that I had him turned the wrong way. <laughs> he wasn't quite looking at you. I was like, really? Uh, but the message was this. You're going to have a meeting with Jesus. Every one of us is. And some of that congregation I was talking to, uh, we're going to meet them long before I did. And are you ready for the meeting? Because it's the most important meeting of your life. 
Are you ready to have that meeting? Because there's so many people out there that think they're going to heaven. Right? I, people not even in the faith. They think they're going to heaven. And you go, why do you think you're going to heaven? Oh, because I've been good. I give to charity and I care about the poor. And it's like, that's not why you're going to heaven. You're going to heaven because you're a sinner who recognizes they need a savior and that Jesus died for your sins. That's why you go to heaven. It has nothing to do with what you did. You have zero to do with you going to heaven. It had to do with you saying, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And God providing a savior through Jesus Christ. And it's grace through faith. That's why you go to heaven. And so so you get all these people who think they're going to heaven and they're not ready to meet Jesus. They're not ready to have these questions. Because Jesus didn't care about your job, your title, how much money you made, your your house, your car, anything. He didn't care about any of that crap. I, I once preached about legacy and I was talking about, you know, what's the what's the biggest legacy you can leave? your kids and they're like oh inheritance well i was like no no the only the only legacy you leave on this earth the only legacy is sharing christ with somebody that's it and, and here's why i know within two or three generations after you die you no one will remember you you're gonna be a name on ancestry.com that's it and i always ask people tell me tell me some details about your great 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 grandfather unless, unless the guy's a civil war hero or something or a world war you know, one hero or something like that that nobody knows I can barely name my great grand grandparents or whoever they were. The only legacy you have is sharing Jesus with your kids and their kids and their kids and their kids. That's the only legacy. Because it's the only way you're going to be reunited with them. And so you gotta think the long game. You you wanna you wanna do things by God's agenda? You think the long game. You think about eternity. You don't think about stuff here. You don't give value to things here. You keep your treasure stored in heaven. You, you you know, keep your eyes on heavenly things, not earthly things. You make sure that you're ready for the meeting. Because that meeting can happen anytime. That meeting can happen today. I, I could, I could, I could fall dead right here at the mic. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, <laughs> Facebook Live. <laughs> and had I had the meeting, I'd be right there with Jesus. Paul says to be out of the body is to be with Christ. Are you ready for the meeting? I'm ready for the meeting. It's great. I'm, I'm so excited for my meeting. Um, it, the first part's gonna suck, but the back part's gonna be okay. Uh, how else has God set your agenda? Does he pick who you marry? Does he pick the, you should have this job or not? Should he? Here's what I know. When it comes to the very details of your life, you need to pray about it. Wife came in the other day and she was uh, talking to me about a situation she has at work with, with uh, one, of her, one of her patients. And, uh, um, and it, was, it was a question about visiting him or something like this. And, and I said, well, have you prayed about it? I go go pray about it. And then she came back. She was calm, ready. Yeah, God God gave her the answer. So, bueno. Pray about everything. Scripture says pray unceasingly. I mean, I, I'm in constant conversation with God. I'm just yammering away, and He's kind of talking to me, and I'm usually complaining about something. Um, but if you want God to set set your agenda, you gotta let Him talk to you, and you gotta ask Him. Ask God all sorts of things. Right? So I'm doing a workout today. I'm, I'm tired. I don't know why my legs are not doing great. I'm on the elliptical. And uh, I'm watching this uh, uh, Lord of the Rings thing. I never watched it before. And I'm watching the first the first video, the first Blu-ray. And I've done 22 miles on the elliptical watching that thing. That is one long freaking movie. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm struggling just, you know, today. Just, and I want to quit. I just want to quit. And I'm like, Lord... You know, why, why why is this not working today? Should I keep going? Yeah, keep going. Okay. I'm plugging along, drinking the Gatorade, trying to trying to keep going. Lord, should I keep going? Yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll get to 12 miles today. Okay. And I did. I got 12 miles today. And, uh, um, you know, I, I ask him about everything. I'm always in conversation with him because I want to make sure that what I'm doing is something he wants me to do, even in the smallest thing. So if you're going to marry somebody, you better be talking to God about it. If you're going to... Um, make a major purchase, better be talking to God about it. You're going to make a minor purchase, talk to God about it. You want to, um, you know, figure out who you should invite to a, an event, talk to God about it. You might be surprised. He may have you invite someone you're not ready to. Uh, all of these things, always pray, 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 pray. But don't expect God, and this is what Keller's saying, don't expect God to meet your agenda. 
So if you're struggling with something, I, I know a lot of people have struggled with stuff, to expect God just to walk in and fix it, that, that, he could. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen miracles. But that might be not his will for you. Um, I always joke, I had half my stomach removed a number of years ago. I'm like, God's not going to put half my stomach back together. I just don't see that happening. Could. He could do it like that. But that's not his will for me. Um, so I struggle with all the things you do with, you know, post-gastric issue. I have all sorts of issues with it. I'd love for God to give me half a stomach back. Oh, woo, that'd be great. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be a wild man. And I think that that's why he doesn't, because I'd be a wild man. And, uh, um, you know, God, God's ways are okay. And sometimes what you got to do is submit yourself to that place where uh, there's a great, a great ministry called I Am Second. And it's about how you submit yourself to God. And you have to be second. It's not my will be done. It's the Lord's will be done. And when your agenda isn't to follow God, right? Because you know, on God's agenda, you guys can line up. Everyone can line up with God's agenda. But you really have to be humble about it. You really have to say, in those moments where you don't understand, when things are going badly, when things are not, when you're like, where is God in this? This is crazy what's happening. And it could be personal harm things. I mean, crazy, crazy, crazy things can be happening. you got to trust in the Lord that for whatever reason things are happening, it's all going to work out. Now, I think the worst thing we think about is, I don't think about it this way, but a lot of people do. Um, what if I die? You know, a home invasion and someone kills me. Uh, what if I'm tortured and killed? I always think that this, my last breath here is my first breath there. And that ain't so bad. I mean, the worst case scenario is you die and you're with Jesus. Um, okay, I'm great. <laughs> let's, let's do it, <laughs> right? And it's, it's, it's so funny because if you really think about it, no one's really worried about being dead. They're just worried about the dying process. Nobody wants a, a bad death. They want it to just, I just want to go to sleep and wake up with Jesus. Um, I get that. I want to go to sleep and wake up with Jesus. Uh, but what we fear is the death process. What if I suffer during death? And what if I'm X, Y, and Z? Um, you you got to trust God and go, you know, I'm not going to put any value in that because it has no value. Even though on earthly terms, we give it a ton of value, right? If you ever read the book, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, or Jesus Freaks, it talks about all the people that, that were killed for the faith and just the amazing courage and strength that they had as they were going through these things. And I believe that that same Holy Spirit involved me and you, and that we, you know, you thought, I could never do that. Well, I think the Holy Spirit would be doing something to you that, yeah, you would be able to do that. So don't worry about things you can't control. Don't worry about things that, you know, like Scripture says, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worries of its own. But have faith that whatever is going to happen to you, God is allowing. He's sovereign, and he's allowing it for his good purpose, whether it's because everyone has free will, uh, whatever it might be. And it's going to work out. In the end, everything works out. And that this little tiny speck of time we have on this earth compared to the eternity that we're going to have with Jesus isn't something we should really give a ton of, of value to. Not a ton of value in terms of what stuff happens to us. I saw a great line. I, I was watching that that, um, that movie. And you know, it's not really my thing, but I'm going to watch the trilogy just to say I did. Uh, but I think this Gandalf character, he, he makes this comment about no one kind of picks the time that they live in, but what you do is make the best of the time you have. I thought it was a great line because you know, we don't know when, what time we're going to be born in. We don't know the circumstances. You know, I, I could tell you that I would never think America would be going through what it's going through in my lifetime, but it is. Uh, but what matters is what I do with my time. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. It doesn't matter the circumstances. It doesn't matter whether I was born in the Middle Ages or first century or, you know, now. What matters is what I do with my time. So that was a smart, smart, smart thing, Gandalf, whoever you are. Uh, so what are you doing with your time? Are you trying to get God to meet your agenda? Are you upset with God because he's not meeting your expectations? Do you think God's unreasonable? Francis Chan does a great a great sermon on, on you, everyone thinking God's unreasonable because we're selfish and he's not doing what we want him to. I think that Keller's right. 
that what we don't do is allow God to set our agenda. Because you don't know scripture well enough, because you don't know Jesus well enough, because you're really not sold out to the faith. You got a foot in the world, a foot in the faith. Um, yeah, you, you, you just don't let him set the agenda. And that's why you're always grading because God's not doing what you wanted to do or you don't see God's hand in the things you want to see him or you not don't feel the Holy Spirit or whatever it might be. Because you're not really allowing God to set your agenda. You're trying to still set your agenda and control it because we're control freaks uh, instead of just completely letting go and letting God set the agenda and then trying to line up with that agenda no matter how much you have to wrestle with him about it by recognizing those those big areas we talked about and understanding God's right, you're wrong. No matter what the culture says, no matter what the world says, no matter what, no matter what, God's right, you're wrong. And that's uh, that's how I live my life. If I ever question about something uh, going on with God and I, I always start from that perspective. I'm wrong. <laughs> God's right because he's perfect. Because if he's not, he's not God. And so, um, yeah, there's there's a lot there to talk about in that little phrase, if I if you say I believe in God, I trust a God, and He didn't come through, you only trust a God to meet your agenda, not a God who could set your agenda. A lot to talk about in that phrase. So I hope tonight was a little bit useful to you in terms of um, kind of a reset, maybe a pivot in your thinking. Uh, use another word to kind of lean into those things. My friend Michelle Deister hates that. Um, you gotta you gotta really think about. Who is God? Tozer once said, he goes, the most important thought you have is when someone says God, what you think. Right? And and so, who is God to you? Is he an equal of some sort? Is he just different than you? And is he supposed to just do what you want him to do? And of course we go, oh, no, no, no. But when, it, when push comes to shove, it's kind of, yeah, 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 right? So, think about, think about this idea of submitting yourself. I mean, really going, okay, God, I don't understand you. I don't understand why you do things. I don't know where you were. I don't get it. Look backwards. Look in third person. See his hand. But trust through faith that no matter what happens to you or others, I mean, no matter how hard, because there are hard things. You lose a child. You you know, you have, you have personal trauma, whatever it might be. There are hard things in life. Um, God will see it through. And that you can trust in that. And that he will bring good out of all things for those who love him. And so we don't know what that looks like all the time. I certainly wouldn't have told you this is what I'd be doing um, with all my pain. But it's great. Because I kind of get this idea that Keller's talking about. That I want God to set my agenda. And I need to stop being so selfish. I need to be less. He needs to be more. Actually, I need to be nothing. And he needs to be everything. So hope I hope that was helpful. Um, Gives you food, food for thought. If you have any questions, you know where to get me. Just send me a message or whatever. And uh, uh, it's Friday night, so get out there and barbecue or do whatever you're going to do. And I hope you have a fantastic weekend. It's supposed to be sunny here in Oregon for a few days. So enjoy it. And I will catch you not Tuesday, Sunday, I think, next Sunday. So uh, be blessed until then.